It's another great day. We come together in the presence of God. We are on lesson three of this series, which this is the final lesson, the outwardly focused Christian. So what have we learned the past two weeks? Have we learned anything? First week we talked about how our focus needs to be outward. It needs to be on our brothers and sisters. It needs to be on ministering to others. And we need to use our gifts to glorify God to build up the body. Those are the two things that we've learned so far. When we think about building up the body, what comes to mind? But building up the body doesn't come accidentally. The things we do as far as Christians, as far as serving God, as far as building up the body, they must be deliberate decisions we make every day. We've got to decide this is what we're going to do. We always have a choice whether or not to serve. Always. God never forces us to do anything. Especially if He hasn't prepared us first. I mean, have you ever went in to a job or a task completely unprepared? God will never ask you to do something He hasn't prepared you first for. So think about that. If you're called to serve, God knows you have the tools. And so to build up the body of Christ, the church, we must commit. Because frankly, some days it's not going to be so easy to want to build up the body. And some days, everything's not going to go our way. And we know how we might get if someone doesn't accept my encouragement or if everything don't go my way. So we have to make a deliberate decision. I'm going to do whatever it is I can to build up the body regardless. We have to understand that commitment means no turning back. And I think our society today don't understand that. Commitment today means I will do this if nothing better comes along. Now I'm not going to get on my soapbox about high school kids committing to colleges anymore because I do that all the time. Don't tell me you commit if you're going to change your mind. I mean, I always compare it to, okay, uh, I stood up and I married Tammy. I'm going to commit to you, but I still want to date a few other people. Is that all right? Not at all. Do you think we'd be married? See, there is a commitment means I am going to stick with you no matter what. So we have to decide to commit. I will commit. We need to tell our people that. I will commit to the end. One of the first things we need to know is understanding that idea of commitment. Webster defines commitment as to obligate or pledge oneself. So I'm going to build up the body. I'm going to become part of the body of Christ. When I choose Jesus as my Savior, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to give you control of my life, God. That's what I'm saying. You know, there's a story told of a chicken and a pig on a farm one day just talking about how great they had it. How wonderful the farm life was. How great the farmer treated them and how he kept everything just in order and neat. And so one day while they were talking, the, the chicken looked at the pig and said, You know what we ought to do? We ought to make the farmer a really nice breakfast. The pig looked at the chicken and said, that's a donation for you. That's a commitment for me. <laughs> You've got to commit. You've got to make a decision. 
Because when we become Christians, and you've heard me say this before and you'll hear me say it again, you can't become an on-Christian. You can only become an unfaithful Christian. And that's frightening. Look at what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, If they have escaped the corruption of this world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off in the end than they were at the beginning. Peter's saying they're better off never to know Jesus than to know Him and turn their back on Him. Once you make the commitment, follow through. Brings us to the question, why do people leave the church? I mean, people do it all the time. You know, people leave congregations, go to different congregations. People leave the church and go to a different type of church. People just leave the church altogether. Now, there have been many studies done on, on the subject. And there are many answers that are repeated. When, when people who have left the church are, are interviewed and they'll say, Why did you leave? I mean, there is a whole gamut of answers. But there's three that, that come out a lot. Somebody hurt my feelings. You know what? Anytime there's two people together, somebody's going to hurt your feelings. It's going to happen. I don't care how good of friends you are. I don't care if you're married for 50 years. The other person's going to hurt your feelings at one point. It happens. And it's not usually out of hatred. But usually it's an innocent comment that just wasn't thought through. Or that was taken the wrong way. Another reason is people say, I had no opportunity to serve. Now, sometimes this is true, but most of the time, it's nobody tapped me on the shoulder and took me by the hand and asked me to do anything. Friends, we offer all kinds of opportunities to serve. I mean, just us right now, you know, we're, we're offering opportunities to serve in cleaning the building. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, okay, mow the yard. Oh, I don't want to do that. There's no opportunities to serve in what I want to do. That's usually what they're saying. And people, we ask for volunteers. But too many people think, well, if they don't come to me personally, then they don't mean me. Yeah. But that's an excuse that comes out. And then one of the other ones... They feel like they're doing all the work and they become resentful of those that are, as they perceive, doing nothing. I just can't stay there. I just can't work with those people. You know, church dropout or dropouts are usually directly related to burnout and about something. Burnout about something. Sometimes we work for the wrong reasons. And that's what causes burnout, especially when we look at that last reason. Because we have decided we're working to please people instead of to please God. And again, friends, it doesn't matter. When you get a group of people together, you're not going to please everybody. You're not. Not everybody's going to like the way you do things. Not everybody's going to like what you say or how you handle things. But see, when we serve God and we serve to please Him, that's where our glory and honor comes from, from God. If we are working to get pats on the back from men, soon we will get burnt out. We have to remember, though, that we can't work our way into heaven. You know, it doesn't matter what we do, we don't earn heaven. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 that we are saved by grace through faith. 
Now, that entails a lot. A lot of people will take that and run with it and say, that means I don't have any responsibility. Well, to do that would be throwing away much of the Bible. You see, faith is going to lead us to action, to do. But when we look at Ephesians 2 and read what Paul writes here, the key to this whole thing is in verse 10. And in Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has saved us, and He has prepared good works for us to do. In order to get into heaven? No. But because we have committed our lives to Him and have become servants of the Most High God. And our desire is to please Him. We can do a lot of good works but not one of them will buy our way into heaven. Not one. And the thing we have to remember, God blesses us with many talents. Well, maybe you only have one, but as a group, we have many talents. Use it or lose it. We know what it's like. If, if you're laid up in bed or not able to get around for a long time, don't you lose muscle tone? Don't you get weak? How many people here have heard of the big three? They had a big tournament here in Dallas this weekend, the basketball. I never knew what it was until Friday night. It's guys that used to play in the NBA that can't play any better than I can now. Well, maybe they're a little bit better. But I, I sat there and I turned it on and I forget what the score was. But I turned away from it because I wasn't really interested. And about 15 minutes later I turned it back. One basket had been made. One basket. Well, because why? These guys are getting older and a lot of them hadn't done anything to sharpen their skills. They've been sitting around until somebody come up with this idea. Hey, let's get these teams together. I mean, and they're only playing half court. And there's only three on a team. But you sit there and you think, this is a prime example of use it or lose it. And it was kind of amusing at times. But yet we have talents that God has given us. But if we don't use them, we're going to lose them. You see, the other side of burnout, of being too busy, is non-participation. Not doing anything. Friends, Paul made it clear that we don't work to be saved, but we work because we are saved. When God gives us a talent, He wants us to use it. Just think back to the parable of the talents. The end of that, look what Matthew writes, recording the words of Jesus, Matthew 25, 29. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has <clears throat> will be taken away from him. Think about what that means. Remember, the, the five-talent guy gained five more talents. Two-talent guy gained two more. The one-talent guy buried it, didn't use it. It was taken away from him. You're not going to use it? Then you don't need it. We'll give it to somebody that can. So basically, the, the lesson is here, if you want to live an abundant life in God, use what He's given you. Use it to the best of your ability. Don't be afraid to fail. Friends, that is a big fear. Failure. But don't be afraid. 
to not be the best. But take the talent that God's given you. Work it. Develop it. And like I said, it could be many. It may be one. But work it and develop it. Say, I will commit to the church. Friends, sometimes that's hard. Because maybe we have some of these other feelings about the church. Well, we go there just because it's the only one close or it's the only one I feel comfortable at. But I'm not really sure I can commit to it. We need to commit to the church because the church is us. It's not the building. It's this body of people that are here. And we are all part of it. And so we have a responsibility to it. You know, we have to avoid a lot of religious traps. <clears throat> there are a lot of religions that make rules and regulations or determine what kind of person you have to be to be part of their religion. You know, I've told you several times before that I take a lot of surveys online. And I, I love the ones that you get from, like, the Christian bookstores and stuff. They always want to go at the end of the survey and say the following questions are for classification purposes only. And then they'll ask you things like, which denomination do you identify with? And they'll say, how, many, how often do you attend church gatherings? Just things like that. But this section always ends with one question. What do you think are the three most important components of Christianity? My, my answer is always the same. There are no three most important components of Christianity. It's a unit. It comes together. It all works together. You know, of course, what they're wanting you to say is, well, I think you have to pray. Or I, I think you've got to be baptized. Oh, you've got to attend services. Friends, I believe every one of those are just as important as the one prior. They're equally important. But there's so much more than just those three things. I mean, it's like saying, what is the most important part of your house? Well, the roof, right? Except if the foundation's bad. Okay, well then the foundation. Oh, well, what about the walls that are weak? Well, you've got to have walls. It's one big thing, and it's all important. Christianity, every part of it, is put together by God. And every part of it is important. We can't break Christianity down into the most important parts. Now, there are some churches that might impose their own rules for membership. But the question is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say are the rules for membership? I know some denominations where you have to fill out an application. And be approved. I, I was reading a book by, by a gentleman who... I'm impressed by some of his thoughts, some of them. But he was talking about someone who came to him and said they was going to join this big church that was in their community. They handed him an application, both personal and credit check. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God isn't concerned about that. He wants my heart 
What were they worried about? The image that you put forth to people. How much are you going to be able to give? Their focus wasn't on people, it was on money. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, which means there's one set of rules. There's one set of rules for getting into the church. And those are the rules that God set forth. When Peter preached the first gospel sermon, what did he say? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the rules for getting into the church. You don't have to fill out an application. You don't have to go before a board of trustees. You don't have to be approved. Oh, and by the way, you cannot join the church. You're added. You're added to the church. God adds you. And once we are added to the church, part of this commitment is understanding that Christianity is not a spectator sport. Now, I know there are many spectating Christians, but it's not a spectator sport. You are telling God, remember, I'm committing to you. That means that everything I have belongs to you. That means when you ask me to do something, I will do it. It means, I belong to you, God. I'm listening to you. And God doesn't ask anybody to just to sit back and watch. Nobody. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has a purpose. Are there any sports fans in here? Besides me? How many Cowboys fans? I raise my hand, but I'm not. I'm a Browns fan, so pray for me. Do you ever second-guess Jason Garrett? Do you ever wonder about the decisions he makes? Why? Why, as fans of teams, do we wonder... I mean, I, I thought about this a lot, but I really thought about it since, well, the trade deadline in baseball. I'm a big Cleveland Indians fan. Terry Francona, their manager, I think he's a great manager. But Cleveland traded away their number one prospect in their minor league system to San Diego to get two pitchers. One is a sidearm pitcher that I don't know why they traded for him. And the other was an all-star closer. I mean, he was, went to the all-star game based on his ability to close a ball game. Cleveland has a closer named Cody Allen. I think closer is a very loose term for him. I think his should be closer. Because if it's a three-run lead when he comes in the game, he wants it to be one run by the time he gets out. But the other night, I'm sitting there watching the game, and it's a one-run game. There's a guy on base, and they bring Cody Allen in. And I'm sitting there thinking, you've traded for an all-star closer, and you bring in Cody Allen. And he's going to put guys on base, guaranteed. And of course, for a fan, you're second guess. Why do you do that? But you know what? Terry Francona is an all-star manager for a reason. These guys that coach these teams, they're there for a reason. And if you ever notice these guys that, that are in this circle of coaching, they get fired, they get hired again for a reason. Because they know something that I don't, that we don't. You know, some people attend church, yet don't actively participate don't get involved in anything and then sit back and criticize what the church is doing. Why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do that? Well, usually they won't say it to the church. They complain to other people. You know what they're doing down there? 
You know what I saw them do? You know what the next great idea is? <gasps> you know, I, I've always been told since I've been 18, if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. I'm not really sure how true that is, but most people won't complain anyway about something. But yet, if you're not going to get involved in what your church does, don't criticize and complain about what they do. If you don't like the way they do things, but yet you're not willing to step up and add your talents to it, don't complain about it. You know, but, but the worst thing is, people that do that, they don't understand the danger they put themselves in. James chapter 4 and verse 17 says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's pretty plain. That is very plain. Well, I know I ought to go down there and do this, but sin. Well, I know I shouldn't say this, but sin. You know, I could do a better job than them, but I'm not going to sin. That's pretty plain. Friends, the church is not all about me. I mean, kind of it is. Because Jesus died on the cross for me, for all of our sins. And everyone who has been immersed for remission of sins has been added to the church... But yet my focus isn't about what can the church do for me. My focus needs to be what can I do for you. How can I use my talents to encourage you? How can I use what God has given me to draw you closer to Him? And the great thing about that is if we all think that way, then the church becomes all about us. But see, when someone sits back and what can the church do for me and expects the church to do for them and to serve them, it all falls apart. But when we're focusing outward on everyone and we're all looking out for the good of everybody else, everybody is being taken care of. We're a group of servants called to glorify God by serving others, especially one another. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. See, if you consider others better than yourselves, you're going to want to take care of their needs first. So finally, I will commit to make a difference. I mean, can we, can we individually honestly make a difference? Can I, as an individual Christian, which that's kind of a misnomer because Christians are all part of a body, but can I, as part of the body, commit to make a difference? How many people remember the 90-day challenge from last week? How many people have failed? So we start again. Because once we get this going, we will make a difference. We will. I mean, you don't look at it this way, but you figure all these big wildfires that hit our country, especially out west, they start with one little spark, one little flame. So can we make a difference? In September of 1857, a man by the name of Joseph Lamphere started a prayer meeting. He went out and he passed out flyers in New York City. And he said he was going to have this prayer meeting at a certain time in this room. He spent a month doing this. Passed out thousands and thousands of flyers. So the day came... He went, and the time came, he was the only one in the room. However, within 30 minutes, 
Six other people showed up. See, even back in 1857, when something really to church, you had to go late. Six other people. So he said, next week, we'll do it again. There was 20 of them. And they finally grew to the point where every church building in New York City was full within six months' time. At this prayer time, having these meetings, they had to branch out. Too bad it's not that way now. But we can make a difference. That was one man. It was estimated that over 600,000 people became acquainted with, and I'm not going to say became Christians, but became acquainted with the Word of God through this one man's plan. 600,000 people. That's a lot of people. Eventually, that number swelled to a million. Depends who you talk to. We don't have to do great things to make a difference. We just have to serve. We just have to touch people with the talents we have. If we look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus says, And if anyone gives you even a cup of cold water, or gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. You don't think about stuff like that, do you? He's saying the littlest bit of service you do to someone is great. It doesn't have to be some great, elaborate ministry planned out and put on by the church and, you know, all the bells and whistles. Pray with somebody. Touch somebody with your compassion. Don't be judgmental. We won't be alone. Remember, we are a body and we will work together. God has equipped us and God has given us a, a, a commission. I mean, I, I've heard people say, well, I can't study with someone. I don't know what to teach them. And my question is, what did you do to become a Christian? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm not... Well, Moses wasn't either. <laughs> but God used him. Because that was an excuse for Moses. The Bible tells us Moses was eloquently trained in speech. That it was an excuse. God's not going to call you to do anything that you cannot do. He's given you a commission. He's given you the knowledge. And then Jesus gave us the greatest promise of all. In Matthew chapter 28, 20. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We will never be alone. So we can commit. We can commit. So family, let us determine today to become an I will church. I will. And we will become one. We will do our part. We will commit. God never promised anything to be easy. He didn't promise us an easy road in the world. He didn't promise us a, a life of leisure. I mean, you look at the disciples that walked with Jesus. They fought and argued among themselves. So we probably are going to do that some too. But it's okay not to get along. We just can't quit loving one another. We can't give up on each other. We just keep moving forward. We learn how to work out our differences. We don't run away. 
You know, one of the things that drives me battier than anything is when someone leaves one congregation and says, I just can't worship with those people. What are they going to do in heaven? I mean, you can't spend an hour. What are you going to do for eternity? I'll tell you. One of them's probably not going to be there. Probably. But we will be the church that God called us to be. Even though we don't have all these promises, what He did promise was an eternal home in heaven for the faithful. We will be faithful. And I know that everybody in this room is concerned about the church. I, I honestly believe that. We all have a concern about the church. It means a lot to us. And so let's start the I will revolution. The I will. We can do that. And I'll guarantee you, God will bless us. God will change us into the type of Christians we need to be. He'll give us the strength we need. And He'll guide us by the hand. But He's not going to grab us. He's not going to yank us. He's not going to drag us kicking and screaming. He's not. He's saying, you know the facts. You make the choice. It's all up to you. And so we answer God by saying, I will. I will. If you're here today, you've never been baptized for mission of sins, tell God, I will. Because you want to be part of that eternal life in heaven. You want to be part of this amazing body we call our church. You want to do your part. Christian, tell God, I will, as you recommit your life to Him today. Tell Him, I will. Use my talents to your glory. I will listen to your direction. And friends, we know that the prayers of the righteous are effective. So if you have something you'd like the church to pray for, say, I will give it to you, God. I will allow the church to pray for me. I will. Because we can. Because it's all through God. And with Him all things are possible. Think about that as we stand and as we sing.